there's many things people mention about you. Some says you're a great speaker, you're a great teacher, you're a great communicator, you're talented, passionate, intelligent. Uh, and I'm really proud uh, of the fact that I got to know you over the years. Uh, so I would like you to share your story uh, about yourself with our audience. In the career journey space, I started my career as a lawyer. Uh, and in that role, I was a prosecutor for 14 years. During that period of time, I tried many, many cases. And what drove me to the courtroom was basically when I graduated college with my bachelor's and my master's, my passion was to write the great American novel. But I knew I was not good enough to write the great American novel. Um, so I had to do some real serious soul searching on what would satisfy me. I'm very excited by hard ideas and solving problems. I love arguing, persuading, influencing. So the courtroom was the natural crucible of learning for me. And that's why I went to law school. I also am a very practical person. I knew I had to earn a living. So if I tried the American novel, I would probably starve. Hence, when I graduated law school, I enjoyed being put in a courtroom where I had to convince 12 people of the facts, one person on the bench of the law, all while my adversary was shooting at me. That's a very exciting intellectual experience. And as exciting as the intellect part of it is, it's equally exciting on the people-to-people -people experience. Because fundamentally in a courtroom, an attorney, whether it's the prosecution or the defense, or a civil or criminal case, an attorney has to persuade a group of people to believe them. They need the facts to do that, but they also have to connect in what we in corporate America like to talk about as emotional intelligence and EQ. Of course, back then, no one was talking about that, and no one was coaching attorneys on how to connect on an emotionally intelligent level. So I was one of very few women back in the early 80s uh, in the Nassau County DA's office, and I had some amazing experiences that taught me so much as a lawyer, as a leader, and as a woman. That's where my formative years were formed, and then I came into Manhattan. I worked for Robert Morgenthau, where when I left him, I was the chief of organized crime narcotics. And that position was a startup. He wanted to create a unit that would take narcotics investigations from farm to arm, from street buck to financial institution. He wanted to do large scale enterprise, as we would say in corporate America, investigations. And I was particularly passionate about that because it involved electronic surveillance. In the prosecution world, in the courtroom, being able to try the murder case, the sex crimes case, the seriously difficult case is very enticing. And when you've done that, you might, if you're like me, want to do something more. To be able to do several wiretaps and hear the criminals planning the drug deals, planning the money laundering, is real-time crime. It's also very hard to get a wiretap because under our Constitution, it's the most invasive form of law enforcement intrusion because we're listening to your conversations on your phone. We're listening to your conversations in your car. So in order to get that, a lawyer has to do a pretty sophisticated application. I enjoyed that intellectual challenge. And what I enjoyed even more was being able to take this evidence and build a case against an entire enterprise of criminals. Um, that was very, very satisfying to me. I never, ever thought I would leave the practice of law. Some funny things were happening in criminal enterprises back then. The Colombian cartel was coming into trafficking uh, in a very big way. If they were in the Fortune 50, they would be near the top. They really understood their supply chain. They understood distribution. They had quality control. They had in-house counsel in terms of the way they managed themselves. They started to use cell phones right around the time corporate America used cell phones. Cell phones afforded them the same sort of mobility they, in, they afforded people in business. And they got very sophisticated at it. So they stopped using regular phones, stopped using pay phones and pagers, which is what they were using for anonymity. And my team and I decided to research and figure out how we could tap a cell phone. We went through the legal rigors of it, convinced ourselves and the district attorney that we could and should tap cell phones. 
And then we went to the cell phone companies. Cell phones back then were a startup. They had not really thought about when they built their networks. They were quilting together cable licenses and building this magnificent thing that became the North American Cellular Network back then, led by Craig McCaw. They hadn't really thought about the fact that they'd need to build some capacity for wiretaps. So we were showing up with our court orders, and they were saying, huh? Uh, so we had some conversations about that, and they were very practical, good leaders because they didn't want bad guys to benefit, but they also were businessmen. They hadn't built in this capacity. So their engineers and our tech folks got together and figured out how to initially use maintenance ports to make it happen. And then, of course, uh, cell phone wiretaps went off the charts in terms of volume. In fact, my little unit led the country in number of taps for several years when I was, in fact, the entire time I was leading it. We did more taps, the five of us, than entire prosecution offices. Every time a, uh, a wiretap order is signed by the, by the judge, a federal form has to be filed with the federal government. That's how serious that invasion is. Uh, and I'm very proud of that because I think the bar should be very high. But the value of the evidence is powerful. So the cell phone companies got to know me because I was somewhat of a pain in the neck with all <laughs> of my orders. Then the criminals realized they could clone cell phones. And how much better would it be for them to take Russell, Sar Russell Sardis' phone, make about 50 of them, give it to their cohorts in New York, Miami, Houston, and L.A. Because if there's 50 Russell Sardis, there's only one real Russell Sardis, and he doesn't know his phone's been cloned. How can Di Maria possibly, or anybody else in law enforcement, know who's saying what to whom? The beautiful thing about cell phones is you can locate them. So we were able to see that they were 50 and one. Uh, and then we got very, very good at figuring out who was where and how to chart it. I became very, very passionate about that kind of wiretap because the criminals thought they could speak very blatantly. It's rare when you intercept a criminal drug conversation that they will use the term narcotics, cocaine, or heroin. They use, they use code words. But on the cloned cell phones, which they thought no one knew about, they would be much franker. So my cases would be very, very strong. And in order for me to do those taps, I had to, in my legal application, explain to the court what a clone phone was. And her honor would say, well, this Russell Sarder guy, I, I don't want you listening to him. He's not the criminal. How are you going to show me that his privacy isn't going to be invaded? I could demonstrate that because I was able to triangulate on the location. And in doing that, the cell phone companies saw that I was speaking to law enforcement, publishing on how to do these kind of taps. They were smart. And uh, they, when they had an opening, a recruiter called me and said, we're wondering if you'd be interested in this job. And, and the job was basically to solve the clone phone problem for Macaw Cellular then, that was then taken over by AT&T Wireless, and the industry, because an AT&T wireless customer who lands in Chicago and is roaming on a roaming partner's network, if they're cloned, they don't care uh, that it was on a roaming network. They're going to blame AT&T wireless. So the person they hired for this position had to not only solve it for the Macaw AT&T community, but for the whole industry. So they had to be able to work collaboratively to drive Now I a see the connection. I was always uh, curious how did you end up working uh, for AT&T. So you were there. Uh, almost uh, six years. A long seven, time, from 94 to 2001. 90, and then from there you went to uh, uh, Merrill Lynch. Uh, and tell me a little bit uh, w what you did for Merrill Lynch and, uh, and about your experience uh, with uh, building Merrill Lynch University. Sure. I'm really uh, interested about that. Well, when Merrill Lynch came to me, understand I, I am a lawyer that moved into business. Um, a along the way, AT&T invested in me in, in wonderful ways. I was very privileged. And when I left AT&T, I had a 500-person organization managing everything from supply management to call centers on new phones to all sorts of things. Uh, every shared services enterprise risk function as we defined it. So I was coming to Merrill Lynch with a business experience based on a lawyer's foundation that was a courtroom-trained attorney. 
And if you're a trial attorney, your, your communication skills have to be very good. If you are a lawyer, you have to be disciplined thinking. Then at t gave me the business savvy and the business skills. I didn't come from HR. And one of the reasons that I was passionate about the human resources chief learning officer work was in Macaw, one of our principles was to run lean. Now, when AT&T took us over, a whole team of wonderfully talented human resources learning people came on board. We didn't have any of that at Macaw. At Macaw, we were expected to do that ourselves. We had a lean HR team that would absolutely support us, but I was fully expected by my CEO to develop my leaders, to drive their performance, to optimize it, and to make working with me in our company a fabulously innovative, exciting, engaging place. Um, so f for my mind, what every leader that Craig McCaw printed, they were a chief learning officer. Because, and in my opinion, I really believe this, Great leaders have to be fantastic learners and passionate teachers. What makes a great leader? There are many, many things written on this. There are even more things spoken about it by very, very erudite and educated people. And there are so many great leaders speaking about it. I love to listen to all of them. In my opinion, a great leader is someone that is always looking for a new solution, someone who is intellectually curious, who really wants the people around him or her to feel like they can come with ideas that are totally opposite what they have. That's, what lear that's the fundamental tenet of learning. If a leader has that, and is principled and committed to it, there is nothing that can stop that leader because creativity is unleashed. I think one of the things that we sometimes really fail at is missing the point that feedback has to be two-way. Leaders who develop their people, who sit there and tell them how well they did and never ask how they did, that, that's not leading, that's dictating. I came up with a framework uh, that, uh, so the name of the framework called VISTA, leader must be visionary, be inspiring, smart, trustworthy. Leaders must ha have the ability to execute. Does that make sense and what flaws do you see uh, on that framework? I actually think that framework is very consistent with another, a whole series of frameworks that exist. Noel Tishy's work on the teachable point of view and the virtual teacher si I teaching love cycle. Teach. I, I think, I think Tishy puts his finger on so many fundamentals. Um, one of the important things in what you've just described is that leaders do have to have an edge. Uh, as Tishy says, you have to make the hard decisions. It is really critical that the people working with you feel that they can push back on you, that they can bring an idea to the table and engage with you. At the end of the day, that doesn't mean you have to agree with every opposing point of view, but you have to be able to listen to it, engage with it, and then make a decision that you can say to your colleague, here's why I'm not going that way. That's how real, authentic leaders, I believe, work. In your framework with the vision and the structure that you've put in place, it's much like Jerry Porus and Jim Collins in building their company's vision. All of those fabulous companies that achieved in their work had a core ideology that in included, had two parts, a core purpose and values. And they said the values never change. The purpose may, depending on what's happening in the market. But those two together paired with an envisioned future, and you have success from Sony to Disney. I think what you've just done with the leader of learner overlays both Tishy's principles and theirs. And I know that every leader has their own style uh, because uh, 
if we know who we are as a person, if we have a great understanding, all of us have our own life story and sometimes our own life story drives the values and the principles that we have. Uh, what is your leadership style? Well, you know, that life story you're talking about is really our learning journey. What brings you to this table from when you were born to now was a learning journey, and the same for me. So I think you can't escape that. And the journey that you and I take forward, the same thing. If we're engaged and aware and committed to it, there is nothing that will stop us from growing. Learning is transformation. Leadership style is, I sometimes wonder, yes, we can do all sorts of analytics and diagnostics on leadership style and they're useful for us in corporate America and they can bring us discipline and structure and we can talk about whether under Meyer Briggs I'm an ENTJ, you're an I. That's really wonderful but I think it kind of misses the point. At the end of the day it really comes down to I think the set of values that drive you as a leader. For me the definition of leadership could be defined as two axes. One is, one axis is the value you bring to the business, the value contribution you give, and the other axis is the values that govern your behavior, the values in your heart that say, this is how I will live my life, this is how I will treat others. In that nexus, in that inflection point, that is where leadership happens. And my leadership style, in the context of the traditional answer, I'm very direct. Uh, along the way of my learning journey, I learned sometimes I was painfully direct and I wasn't really having the impact I needed to be, but that's what happens when you're young uh, and you're a trial attorney and you're born to fight in a, cl in a courtroom. You learn that that has to change if you want people to be safe and come back to you. Uh, my most important value is respect. Respect for the other person, respect for the integrity of our communication, respect for the process, and respect for our business. I have zero tolerance for lack of respect. Hence, inclusion is one of the most important things to me. I be being a woman and being the only woman on certain teams in law enforcement led me to have some learning journeys that were, I think, had to be very unique than yours or somebody else's. Um, and I probably learned the most from them because I was a marginalized minority and I had a fire and passion in my belly to perform. And somehow I had to learn that, yeah, I'm different and how do I use that to my advantage? Uh, have you ever been to a crisis and how do you handle crisis? Uh, does your leadership style change you in crisis? Well, it's, it, crisis leaders sometimes um, are extraordinary in managing the crisis but can't manage the rebuilding. Similarly, startup leaders sometimes are not great leaders when the startup um, has to go to a growth leader. So all of that really suggests that leaders are, are segmented. I personally believe, because I believe learning unleashes the power in all of us, I think you can study and learn how to do it better. But operating under stress, uh, take, for instance, 9-11 in New York City. Rudy Giuliani was a spectacular crisis leader. Many questioned whether after the crisis he could be effective in rebuilding the city. And I think the answer to that is self-evident in history. Because I tend to be very direct, because I'm actually excited at the notion of going to battle in a courtroom or going to battle in a wire room with a criminal enterprise or taking on the Kali cartel, who are basically eroding an, an industry, or threatening an industry's profitability. I like crisis. <laughs> in fact, I enjoy crisis as much as I enjoy hard problems. And I think you're right. In a crisis, you have to communicate clearly, and someone has to make decisions. That sometimes means your ability to be collaborative has to be managed differently. But you'd better be getting the feedback you need from the right people, or those crisis decisions you're making are going to be at risk. At the end of the day, it comes down to the ability to make decisions under fire and knowing how to get the best information. In the non-crisis setting we were talking about before, in many ways, it's similar. The ability to get feedback so that you can make a better decision. You have been successful in your life. 
there's a lot of the great things you did. Uh, you, from the lawyer to working in the corporate environment to study your own business, and uh, you're working with all the top CEOs. Uh, what do you think made you successful? I think to be successful, as you said earlier, you have to take the long, hard journey to figure out where you are in this life and who you are and what your values are. And I don't think that journey ever ends. But if, if you can go deep inside yourself and decide who you are, who you want to be, and then be very passionate about living it, it all comes together. You have to have the competence, you have to be committed, and then you have to have the infrastructure to support it. At the end of the day, you know, this is an interesting question because many times people will say, what is your biggest personal success? What's your busy, biggest business success? What's your biggest personal failure, your biggest business failure? There's a problem there because that suggests that there's two segments of me, that I'm someone else in my personal life than I am in my business life. When I die, Russell, there's going to be one gravestone, and it's going to say, I hope, if I'm true, and if I accomplish what I want in this life, that she made a difference to the people and the businesses she touched in this life. There's not going to be two gravestones. I had one life. And I think that sometimes we make that mistake. I think we, or, or leaders think, that they can be two different people. When you do that, you go down a very slippery slope that I think is destined for disaster. What is your position on work-life balance? Can you really separate work have one life for work and one life for, uh, uh, for personal life then? I've been miserable at work-life balance. Um, and and maybe, that, <laughs> maybe that's an unfair statement. I am very fortunate in this life um, that I met and married a man who, like me, gets his sense of self and um, fulfillment in this life from our love from each other and from our two careers. So for us, work-life balance is easy because we are both deeply passionate about our careers. Who we are in that sense of self is fed by that excitement because we are constantly on a learning journey and a performance journey. And our love for each other supports that. So when you're in a relationship like that, it's okay if you have to work on a birthday or on Valentine's Day. I'm not suggesting that this is balance in any traditional sense, but the good Lord has been good to me. He's given me a partner that shares the same approach to balance. I think everyone has to figure that out for themselves. Had I chosen to have a family, I don't think this would have worked at all. And I think that's one of the major challenges right now that corporate America faces. Women in the workplace and men in the workplace with families the rules of the game have has changed dramatically in terms of balance. And the demands of the workplace have gotten much harder. Globalization in technology has made the workplace expand like a gas to fill the containers of our lives. We are never disconnected, we are never off the grid, and we can't afford to be given the economic demands of our times. So I think work-life balance is going to be a challenge, even more so going forward. As you know that I, I consider you my mentor. Uh, uh, I have uh, uh, a few mentors and I know that uh, most of my mentors are helping me to shape my life. Uh, you are mentoring all the successful people, but do you have a mentor? Do you have somebody who helped you to shape your life? I've had a few. Um, and they're all men, Russell. And what they taught me about leadership they taught me by being it, by living it. Uh, my <laughs> one of my first bosses at AT&T Wireless was very influential to me. His name is Rala Huff. He's currently the CEO of Earthlink. Uh, before that, he was the CEO of Empower. And before that, uh, he ran one of our regions. And when, when I reported to him, he came over from AT&T and was our CFO. And we were very new to each other. And what I learned from him was really how to 
develop people and how to manage myself. Um, he, in terms of developing people, in one of my first performance reviews, he said, you know, your people love you. I mean, they really love you. You're passionate, you're exciting, uh, you are so committed that it can be quite inspiring. But you know, Rosanna, it, it can be pretty intimidating. He says, that strength, when you overuse it, can scare people. He says, and I think your people love you so much that they would be afraid to come to you to ask you if they should take a job somewhere else. And if you really are a good leader and mentor, your people f should feel safe enough to you to come to you and say, hey, Rosanna, I have an offer from IBM, and I'd really like to talk to you about it. He says, your people won't come to you like that right now because you care about them so much, they care about you, and they don't. And I didn't understand that, Russell, because I was always encouraging people to disagree with me. You know, if you're a trial attorney, you want an adversary to disagree with you. So if they can disagree with me, why wouldn't they come to me for that? And he was an extremely emotional, intelligent guy, and he said, because you've connected their heart. You have to figure out how to make that safe. And that was, I think, singularly one of the best pieces of advice I've ever gotten. I've built entire leadership development programs around that principle. And when I talk to leaders uh, and say to them, how do you feel about this? Most of them are taken back. Not only did Rala Huff give me that advice, he challenged me to do something about it in, in the, that year's performance goals. So I had to make it happen. And the, the way I approached it, being a lawyer and thinking uh, through the problem, I sat down with my direct reports and said, over the next year, when you are going to have to do your resume for me, and every year you're going to have to add three bullets that you have achieved that has made you more marketable. And I'm going to invest in you, in your performance goals, by giving you stretch assignments, putting you in different situations where you can deliver measurable value that will make you more marketable in the workplace. So my goal was making them more marketable. A lot of leaders, when I've told them this, said, you've lost your mind. But you know, I think Rollo was right. Because if I'm willing to invest in you that way, and I do, and I make you more marketable, and someone comes along and makes you an offer, and you can come to me and have that conversation, one thing that's going to be in the back of your mind, am I going to be able to do this in the next place? Are they going to invest in me the same way? And either you stay with me, which is wonderful, or you go on and build a success somewhere else and build the legacy of my brand, and more talent comes to me. So, you know, when you give away roses, the smell stays with you as well as the person you give it to. I think Rolla was a very influential mentor to me. There's an interesting point in time, uh, particularly if you're mentoring a young person, right? Because when they're young, it's a total green field ahead. And they haven't made many of the mistakes yet that we all make. You can't learn without making mistakes. In fact, you don't learn from what you do well. You learn from making mistakes. And what I frequently say is, you think I got this good easily? No, I made mistakes all the time. <laughs> the more mistakes, the better I get to be. The trick is not to make the same mistake twice. Um, so it's always joyful to mentor a very young person because you know the story. You've seen the movie. Uh, and then there comes a time, um, a bulldog's roman, as they say in literature, where they cross over the Rubicon and they come into their own. And now they talk to you as a peer. And that's a wonderfully fulfilling situation. One of the most fulfilling experiences for me is to have someone who's worked with me in the past, to have a student who's had me in the past write to me and say, I want you to know I've never forgotten you and here are the things you've done for me. I had the most unique experience this year, actually, uh, and this was very unique. I, on Facebook of all places, I received an email from someone who I was not connected to, and they put that in a special place. Um, and I don't even know how I discovered it, because I don't spend all that much. My email, I, I'm usually on my personal and business email. Not on. And this email was from a man who said, I don't know if you remember me, uh, but you sent me to prison, and you saved my life. 
and I'm now extremely successful and I've gotten to do things in my business other people only dream of and I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for you um, and he signed it and I he said I would really like to talk to you so I ended up uh, calling him up and it was my very first wiretap trial ever I had an extraordinarily good a felony against him and uh, the entire case decided to plead out and it was the right thing to give him a plea and he went to prison his mother uh, he tells me credits me with him still being alive because then he was working he was driving um, a bus in the music industry driving bands around and there was a lot of drug proliferation and he was using it she feels he would have died he's come out and started a fabulous business building coaches for the meta uh, for the music industry he hobnobs with very rich and famous people he hires people who were out of prison makes the world a better place and uh, he had a heart attack a few years ago and he came out with a bucket list and I was on it now that's an example that I never thought I'd be sitting here talking about but I have to tell you it's one of my most proud um, and certainly when prosecutors are making those choices you're not really thinking in that realm you're really thinking about if you're a good prosecutor what's the fair thing to do for society for the person for the system but I'm pretty proud about that one why is it important for businesses to build a learning organization it's not important if the business doesn't have to change so if the business has to do one thing and doing that one thing there's always a market for it never has to change then it doesn't have to learn anything but what we know in 2013 is there is no such business like that anymore so if you are not learning you're not moving forward and you can't be competitive you can't even see what's coming towards you for instance what good is it if you're building the best buggy whip for a horse and buggy when cars are the disruptive innovation that's on the landscape if you truly are committed to leading your organization and taking it to the next level you have to always be making sure you're not building the best buggy whip and that means being forward thinking not just in the traditional operational sense of process improvement total quality all of those good efforts that have value oh, absolutely no question you have to be doing what you're currently doing optimally efficiently and being very effective in executing that optimal efficiency if you're not at the same time thinking about where the puck is going to go to skate over to it you're going to lose in the pace of our economy that means thinking differently look take for example higher education right the big brouhaha in higher education now on whether online has a place is it effective is it going to overtake classroom education does the MOOC really add any value I think a learning organization has to look at that and say hmm, we have to figure this one out there's some great value here how can we optimize it we, but it requires thinking differently frequently what you see happening when educators and even technical groups that are supporting educators who are trying to learn to teach online they look at the best practices in the classroom and they try to figure out how those best practices fit online and I respectfully submit that that's wrong because what you have to do is take the venue for what it is and capitalize on it we have to also accept the fact that education is extremely expensive nowadays and for young people to come out of college with six figures worth of loans in an economy that can be profoundly hard to find a job then what's the value proposition of education any hard-nosed business person would start asking for the business case there right that's uh, that's just one example a learning organization allows people to thrive and allows the business to thrive because it will never settle I like to use this term called restless excellence in my classes and in my business I'm always looking to develop this value of restlessness restlessness is saying what are we doing well today and how how can it be better this is different than typical ongoing improvement it's really willing to blow up the model and think about it differently it is easy to look at what you are not doing well and having to re-engineer it those skills are a ticket to entry 
in performance excellence. The difficulty is being able to see what you're doing well, how it could be done differently. Are you restless enough? That is restless excellence. And I think that's what learning organizations do because they're willing to question themselves. They're willing to question their assumptions. That's a hard thing to do when you're being successful. It's also a hard thing to do when you're breaking the mold. When Merrill Lynch hired me to launch their chief learning office and to build Merrill Lynch University, think about who they hired. They hired someone who was admittedly a very successful prosecutor, a really unique hire by AT&T Wireless. Jim Barksdale led that organization. This man dreams in color and thinks in three-dimensional chess. So he was hiring somebody very, very unique to not only solve his fraud problem, but lead the solution across the industry. That man hired a prosecutor. I guarantee you traditional recruiters would have never even looked at me. Why are you going to hire somebody who's, right? Then Merrill Lynch hires this prosecutor turned business person to launch their CLO. I didn't have a background in traditional learning and development. They were really thinking differently. They were coloring outside the lines. And that's a trend that I think is a smart one in corporate America. You see, even in HR, you see business people being brought in to head HR. At the end of the day, if you're a good leader, you have an HR mindset. And you have the HR mindset that's a strategic business mindset. The sort of things that I did at Merrill Lynch, I was doing for my team of 500. Because as a leader, that's what I needed. I had people like Rala Huff developing me in that way. Um, the hiring of a business person in CLO, I think, recognizes the importance of a learning organization that you can execute against. One of the most common mistakes you see happening is we offer fabulous learning programs, terrific electronic profiles, but none of it is applied to the business. We send people to exciting offsites, but nothing is applied to the business. If you're not pulling through the learning, then you're having a wonderful experience, but you're not adding value to the business. The ability to pull through the learning and make it embed itself in the organization is what causes transformation. And that's where I think many learning and development efforts can fall short. And that's the trick. How do you define learning? Learning is transformation. Learning is being able to look at something and through the process of taking in new information and experiences and see it differently in a way that lets you see it in a more meaningful way or do something differently. And learning doesn't always happen in books. I, I absolutely believe on the job learning. Teach a man to fish. Right? And I, I sort of laugh when, when my students will say, well, Maslow's hierarchy. I says, you're really going to go into your CEO's boardroom and talk about, well, Maslow's hierarchy? He or she is going to stick pins in their eyes. right? Because then we're having an intellectual discussion. Apply Maslow's hierarchy in a way that solves my business problem or that takes something I'm doing and make it better, and then we're on the edge of learning. But this, in many ways, that, uh, and Welch is absolutely right, you have to be able to execute against it. Where it starts, the engine for all this, where we spoke about earlier, intellectual curiosity and the like, is in the leader itself. I mean, for me, if you were to ask me, in the spirit of authentic leadership, what is my purpose? If my purpose is aligned to this end goal of the learning organization, then we have a win. And for me, my purpose is to connect people to their heart and their power, to unleash their soul, to bring their potential beyond the edge of their performance. That's my engine. The way I deploy that in business is what unleashes a learning organization. Because I am insatiable until we can get to the next level. And sometimes we have to create it. Sometimes we have to discover it. How did you promote uh, learning culture uh, within all these organizations when you were at Merrill Lynch? How did you promote that culture? When I was brought to Merrill Lynch to do this job, Stan O'Neill had taken over. 
and he was looking to build an even better Merrill Lynch. So my mission was to execute his view on talent. And his view on talent was that of a meritocracy. And he basically infused his leadership team with people that in his mind fit into that learning organization. He allowed his head of HR to hire someone that had a very unconventional background. I didn't come in as some academics do in the area or someone with a lifelong HR career. He brought in a business person who had a, as you can tell, a strong point of view on what this meant. Merrill Lynch University that we built was the very first time Merrill had a program for managers to go from start to finish. And by the way, it was online with three on sites throughout the course of the year. Everything we did, that online program, we used an excellent learning tool called Harvard Manage Mentor. And we had Harvard Manage Mentor customize the simulations to Merrill-based simulations. So we were applying the business essential learnings, learnings in Merrill simulations throughout. That was an application tool that we used to pull through learning. We created um, a content management system that allowed our bankers and our business people to take their ideas, put something together, and then use it in the pitch for clients. We used an assessment tool that globally that allowed us to look at cultural differences. So if we were going to make a pitch in Asia, we would assess the team we were putting together to do that pitch in Asia to see if they were a cultural fit. And if they weren't, we would educate them on where the issues were to maximize the sale. We were putting some science behind the art of learning and development. And in everything we did, it was premised on applying the learning. We launched a firm-wide talent review process that looked at each leader's strategic thinking, business results, personal leadership, and personal interpersonal leadership. And every leader, we identified the top 200 in Merrill, and then we created leadership development programs for them to go. I, I have great respect for Harvard Business School, and they were all action learning. So I would sit down with the faculty ahead of time and profile my leaders that were going, and they would be putting together, we would put the curriculum together jointly, and then the cohorts that I sent were cohorts that had to work together across the firm to create one firm and then present to their leaders when they came back. We were always solving problems. So all of that architecture was built around a business need. Did you have a framework that you used in Merrill Lynch to develop individualized learning plan for your team and for the organization? Well, at Merrill, we always started with the business need. Um, one need was we had people who were managers who never had the opportunity to have any formal training in management. So we built a program around that that was relevant to the business. In terms of individual development, we launched a performance management system that tied back to Merrill Lynch University. So part of an employee's uh, performance management f electronic file, if you will, included their transcript. And when a, a manager would sit down with an employee to decide the development plan for the year, they could actually electronically access the menu of things. They would identify the employee's need and see what currently existed. I think online is very powerful because it can be anywhere, anytime, and you can update it in real time. We created, um, similarly, a new employee orientation so that if you were having your first day in Tokyo, you would have the same online orientation where you hear and see our leaders and be brought through our policies as someone starting in Akron, Ohio. I think those tools are, are really useful. They're all solving a business need. On the individual performance management development, there were always two parts. One was the what, the specific business-related deliverables, and the how, which would be the value part much like the earlier axis I talked about, the value deliver and the values. So the, the how part could be much softer goals and could be looking at personal development in a little bit different way. But it always had the two components. What is the most effective learning method out there? I think 
the most effective learning method is one that is a crucible that basically melts your current ideas and grows you into a new idea. And for different people, that happens in different ways. I happen to really like live interaction and doing a problem in the live interaction. Of course, for me, that's next to the fire of taking the idea and pushing it and pulling my thinking. Um, I'm a big believer in that. I think if you can't do that in corporate America, you're going to be in trouble. Because there are some things you can't read about. You know, it, it's much like you, you can read about being in love and what it's supposed to be, but until you've been in love, you don't get it. Try to learn riding a bicycle by reading a manual. It's not going to work. So for me, it's an action learning crucible that's most powerful. I found every leader is a reader. So I wanna, I, I, I want, I'm curious to find out what types of book do you like to read? <laughs> oh, Russell, I read a huge eclectic group of things. Um, I am uh, an avid horsewoman. I ride dressage, which is classical horsemanship and the principle of cl classical horsemanship. You wrote a blog about that. Yes, right? I did. I, leadership lessons from the dressage arena. The horse has to carry himself, and that means his hind leg li lifts his front end, and the rider has to be in perfect harmony. Your back melts into the horse's back, and you are basically doing ballet against a rigorous test. Now, there is a huge controversy now on whether the tools modern dressage is doing to force horses into the physical position as opposed to building the muscles in a classical way uh, is the best way to do it. And I, I'm currently reading that book, The Tug of War, Classical versus Modern Dressage. For me, it's a metaphor for human leadership, human to human leadership, because the command and control method, you will do this, you will do it this way, and I will pay you, versus a learning organization where, yeah, you have things you have to deliver for me, but let's see if we can push it further. Let's learn together. Let's take the ideas and build it. To me, there's a big metaphor, but as you said, I've written about leadership lessons in the dressage arena. I love David Baldacci, so I read his most re recent The Forgotten, former prosecutor, you never leave mystery stories. I love Crash of the Titans, of course. Had to read that because by Greg Farrell, that Merrill Lynch factored so prominently in. And uh, most recently, what I just finished was No Easy Day by Mark Owen, the uh, story of bin Laden. Because I guess once a prosecutor, always a pr prosecutor. My big regret is I didn't get to do any terrorist investigations. Why do you think it's, in, it's important for organization to invest on their employee learning and development? I think when things get tough, that's when you need to invest in the learning organization. I think the organization that tries to cut that doesn't understand that. And I would even wonder whether they were really doing learning or whether they were doing training. You know, there is a fundamental difference between training skills and transformational learning. Uh, Steve Kerr, Jack Welsh's CLO, a brilliant man who ran Crotonville. I, I love his books. Uh, He's just fabulous. Um, he told me that when I went to Merrill Lynch as CLO, he started using in his lectures this new trend. They're taking business people from outside the industry, and that's we're breaking new ground. Uh, he tells me a story that whenever someone would try to cut his budget, or his, in a business they tried to cut the budget that would Im limit his impact, he would go see Jack and that stopped right away. But Welsh's planted a flag in the learning organization and made it clear that that's how he drove execution. It was his platform for execution. That's the model he used. I think when learning is not one, true learning, as opposed to simply, tra and I'm not diminishing training, we have to do training. But training, we have to remember, training is for skills. Learning is strategic. That's what makes it so hard. When we don't understand that difference, the engine is never maximized, and the learning is never liberated. How do you measure learning ROI? Well, I think one of the problems is we've taken to measuring training by the amount of programs we've offered, how many people have taken it, what's the cost of the program, and figuring out an ROI in a very transactional rubric. What you really want to measure is 
well, the training, uh, are people going out and doing what you've trained them in the skills without mistakes? I mean, I think that's really, and whether the, that is in a customer service model where somehow your calls are getting answered faster, you want to look at it, how it translates into performance and execution. Like Welsh said, that's what you want to measure. On the strategic transformational learning side, it's harder if you don't structure the learning to meet a business need. So if you're building the learning around a need you have in distribution, then you want to see what happens in the business performance in distribution. I think it's very dangerous not to craft learning directly on a business need because then you ha you're, you're relegated to measuring soft stuff that's very, very hard. Um, and in fairness, the pushback on my position could be, but hey, Rosanna, how do you measure whether a leader's gotten better? Well, you can look at their 360s, you can look at if their people are producing more, but at the end of the day, there is no meter that will say this leader now has this much EQ versus this much EQ. It's about the perceptions of the people around them of their performance and what their performance is. I'm a very performance-focused thinker. Everything I do is about driving performance through transformation. So I think the minute you start getting very far away from true performance results related to the business, you're probably getting more and more attenuated to being able to have a good look at the impact. We all know that uh, uh, if an organization wants to grow, if an organization wants to get to the next level, they must have right people and especially right leaders. How do you hire right people and how do you define uh, who is right for the organization? Well, naturally the job demands certain skill sets. You can't get around that, right? Um, but for me, there are two things that have to be, that are critical in embedding in, in talent. One, they have to be passionate and committed to high performance. Not for me, their leader, but for themselves. They have to, they are the kind of people who will not settle for less than high performance from themselves. Because if they have that engine, all I have to do is give them the work. Because the work is a reflection of them. One. Two, they have to have the discipline that's execution focused. They have to want to do to deliver. Because you can be quite passionate and not be passionate about the right things. You know, if your high performance is defined by how many people like you as opposed to how much work you actually deliver, you're, you're not going to succeed. But if you put those two together, and of course, in the circle of integrity and honesty. I read one of your article you wrote uh, called Performance DNA, where you talk about uh, focus, fire, faith, fear. Uh, can you share that framework with us? Yes. I think the F word is critical in performance and right talent. Uh, and the F word that I'm talking about is focus, being able to focus on problems proactively, focus on problems that have happened that you weren't proactive about, reactively and solve them. Stay focused on a goal with the flexibility to know that it may change. Can you stay focused when you are under attack, when the goal is a really hard stretch goal to reach? I think focus is critical. Fire is the passion, that engine that just never goes out. Uh, you can be in a rainstorm and the high performer's fire never gets, never gets wet. Uh, Fear, and this is not fear uh, in a paralyzing way. It's really a fear of disappointing themselves or others in not achieving the goal. Um, I, I know it's not cachet to say leaders need to be feared. Well, feared command and control leaders, you know, some of them are successful, some of them are not. I don't think that's a healthy thing because I, it inhibits creativity. But I do think if a leader is respected, there has to be an underlying fear that the performer doesn't want to disappoint the leader because they care about the leader. So I think that fear is very important. If you don't, and typically the fire, the hotter the, hotter the fire, the higher the fear is because you are driven to succeed. You are natural. 
I, I tell you, uh, you speak with clarity and conviction. I don't have to tell you this, you know that already. Thank you. I'm really impressed.